Hello, from LPL Financial, welcome to The Talking Point. I'm your host, Quincy Crosby. Good morning, everyone. It's Monday morning, February 6th. This is The Talking Point. It's Quincy Crosby. Thank you so much for joining me on the call. I really appreciate it. Well, let's look at the market right now. It is almost 10 o'clock Eastern time. The market is down. The futures market was down. Let's go over it. But before we look at this week's market, let's look at what happened last week that could be contributing to the market this week. First of all, last week we had the Fed meeting and Chairman Powell was pretty pragmatic. He made the case for, you know, perhaps we can get to, um, you know, our 2% inflation target uh, over the course of the year. But he made it very clear that we probably need more rate hikes than the market actually has been factoring in, in, in the futures market, which, by the way, had factored in two rate hikes for this year, the next one being in March, and then you know, sort of holding and then going into rate cuts at the end of the year. That is changing very quickly. And why? Well, the reason is Friday morning. But before we even go there, I want to mention something that Powell has been talking about. It is disinflation. One thing about the Fed uh, chairman and, and chairs uh, is that they come up with a, a word that they like to use over and over again. And because every meeting is now live, every meeting is now has a press conference, it gives more opportunity for us to hear these words. You know, years ago, we never had press conferences. Communication was not as, how shall I say, available as it is now. But the point I want to mention is that his word is disinflation. Janet Yellen, oh my goodness, she used to mention patient. The Fed's going to be patient. We used to count how many times she used that word. Now, Jerome Powell is talking about disinflation. And this is key because he pointed out something. He said, look, we're seeing disinflation, meaning inflation coming down in many quarters. We're, we're looking at it. But he said, in non-core, in core, not counting, not counting housing, ex-housing, he said, we still see inflation climbing. We got to bring that down. He used that ex expression and talking about core inflation a number of times. And he also said, quite pragmatically, look, I can't give you an answer on how many rate hikes. We just know what the goal is. We know where we have to go. And the market, you know, respected it. The market climbed higher. However, when we got to Friday morning, the market had a rethink, a recalibration. And why? because no one expected that unbelievable job report. And one of the reasons that no one expected it was that the ADP report that came out just a few days before actually came in lower than expectations. And remember, that's the private sector report. It doesn't mean it follows what the Labor Department report is, by no means. But what it typically does is give you the trajectory so the market was expecting something in the 100,000 range. Well, 517,000 new jobs is certainly not even in the neighborhood. And, you know, we saw a lot of workers coming in, new workers coming into the job market, which, of course, is important. And even so, the unemployment rate climbed down to 3.4%. Now, right after that, the futures market had a rethink. And it's like, wait a minute, perhaps we're going to need another rate hike uh, in 2023, me meaning three rate hikes to get to where the Fed wants to go. Along with that, the U.S. dollar climbed higher. And this is important because what has been underpinning emerging markets that have done so well? A weaker and softer U.S. dollar. And this is important because the emerging markets have had a tremendous run. China, the reopening of China, stymied still by COVID. But nonetheless, the market sees the reopening coming perhaps in the next quarter as folks go back to work, start to spend uh, uh, in terms of personal um, spending, personal consumption, and, and with the hope that they can do something to uh, fix the ailing, and I mean ailing debt 
debt-laden uh, property uh, market. But nonetheless, the dollar began to strengthen. And I have to stress yet again in this call, that has been a major, major underpinning for going into emerging markets. A weaker dollar does a number of things. It helps ease financial conditions globally. That's one. Second, any emerging market that has dollar-denominated debt, whether it is sovereign debt or corporate debt, it's harder to service that debt when the dollar is so strong. And also, what it does if you are an exporter in an emerging market, the weaker dollar helps your exports, right? It, it's now actually priced in the U.S. dollar, which is weaker against other currencies. So if you're an importer of oil, let's say, that's priced in U.S. dollars, uh, it also helps because obviously uh, you need to import oil. It is a dollar is softer and therefore it's, it's less costly. Turn that around. And if the dollar continues to rise now, it is going to put pressure on emerging markets. One other thing that really did help emerging markets is their valuations were terribly attractive, compelling. And that also helped, again, amid a downdraft in the U.S. market, which is heavily, heavily skewed towards the big megatech names. So we, let's keep this in mind. It doesn't mean that it's over for emerging markets, but I want to make it really clear that they are less liquid, obviously, than developed markets indexes, correct? It doesn't take that much inflow to push those valuation up higher. But we also have something else at work. In India, just to give you an example, you've all been watching that. India had tremendously strong performance in 2022 in the emerging market uh, world. However, a research group in the U.S., the Hindenburg Research Group, has put a major short on Adani, which is a large conglomerate in, um, in India and has gone after them, and uh, it is turning into a, a, a daily drama, a not good drama for India, and not a good drama for emerging markets, and certainly not for the Adani group. So that's also putting pressure on emerging markets because the worry is about contagion, particularly with regard to their bonds, okay? So in any event, let's then bring us up to date for the weekend. Oh, yeah, you know what it is. It's the balloon saga. And this, you know, is, how will I say, an ongoing issue, bilateral issue between the U.S. and China. And concerns, obviously, that that balloon and many others like it coming from China were not, you know, civilian aircraft uh, looking at the climate and climate change and weather, but that it was actually for spying, particularly, you know, when it's sitting there over some of the most important secure areas for the U.S. military in the Midwest. The um, F-22 Raptor, by the way, which mailed it, uh, is a major, major military aircraft. It is a uh, newest version of the one that we all know and sort of grew up with, the uh, F-16s. Yeah, that took it down. But the point here is that it's clear that the bilateral relationship continues to deteriorate. And we have to be careful because geopolitical events have an effect, particularly in emerging markets and also on the, you know, overreaching, overarching uh, markets because the market is sensitive, very sensitive to anything particularly a market like right now in the United States that has a forward earning for the S&P 500 over 18 times, uh, it's 18.4 times actually, uh, the next 12 months. That's rich. And the fact is that the S&P 500 climbed and it went above the level that we've been looking for, 4,100, and it did so with fervor, with determination. We have to keep our eye on that to see if the S&P 500 can maintain that amid a concern that geopolitical events could heat up even more. What's interesting, too, in this whole saga, I just want to point out, is that the Secretary of State was due to go to, um, to Beijing to discuss 
issues to try to, I don't know, you know, salvage the relationship, broaden the relationship. But what's interesting is, of course, he's not going. But what's even more interesting is that the Chinese authorities are saying, well, that's interesting. We never had him on the schedule. So you can't make this up. But what also you can't make up is that it is a Republican and Democrat, this is something that both sides of the aisle agree on, that Chinese expansion, military expansion, needs to be thwarted. Keep in mind that as China came out behind the wall and started growing and growing dramatically to become the world's second largest economy, the theme was that we are, meaning China, we are the um, peaceful giant. That's how they termed themselves. No, don't worry, West, we are the peaceful giant. Obviously, that has changed dramatically. Uh, they are make it very, very clear. They are expansionary. Uh, they will continue with it. And um, keep, your, keep your hands off of Taiwan, the West, because Taiwan belongs to us. That's the message. So in any event, let's look at this week. This week, we are looking at not a, a particularly strong um, schedule for uh, for um, economic data releases, nothing today on Monday. But pay attention, please, tomorrow. Uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, is going to be speaking in Washington, D.C. Uh, everyone is focused on this, particularly after th the, the report that came out on Friday that so shocked the markets, meaning 517,000 new jobs. The, he's obviously, go, I think, going to address it, but he will be asked questions about it with, without a doubt. The other thing I want to point out is that in terms of the earnings season, it's coming in. It's disappointing. It's, it Obviously, it's not stellar by any means, but it hasn't been dramatically terrible either. And that's important. Yes, it is lower than expectations vis-a-vis -vis last year at this time on terms of top line revenue growth and the bottom line. We're also seeing operating margins coming down. But as you saw last week, it wasn't enough to derail the market, a market that sees, you know, that at some point the Fed finishes up in 2023. Obviously, we need a recalibration of that given what we saw on Friday morning. As I said, right now the market is factoring in a third rate hike, 25 basis points this year. So this is all a part of a recalibration, but nonetheless, nonetheless, the market sees 2023 as the finishing point to get to that terminal rate that the Fed has been talking about and that the market has been, been picking up, and that is about five and a quarter uh, percent. So a third rate hike of 25 basis points would give the, give the market that, and then perhaps that would be it. that would be the terminal rate. The um, beat rate, as I said, is, you know, it's, it's not great, but it's not dismal either. And this is where that tug of war in the market is, where the ones who are saying, look, look, the bear is going to be killed with a major sell-off because the operating margins are going to be terrible. The market is just going to say, we can't withstand this. And the market just sells off around the same time that the market perceives that the Fed will be finishing. So, it doesn't look like that now. Most likely what's affecting the market right now is the market is overbought. We came into this week with a market that was overbought. I, I use that term, oversold and overbought. You have to look it up, but there are many metrics that the market looks at for overbought and oversold. And it came in to this week overbought, and it needs to work, work through that. And you know, as I've said so many times, it just needs a catalyst. And, you know, sometimes markets continue to rise in an overbought market. And that, that's in, indicative of a market that obviously wants to keep going up. You can't kill it. But the fact of the matter is Friday's report actually did help to kill it because it's like, wait a minute. Whoa, we weren't expecting this. So we need to work our way through this. But keep in mind, on the S&P 500, let's see where we go because you don't want to go down below 4,100. That was the important line in the sand, and the market launched a significant campaign to cross it last week. So we'll keep our eye on that. Also this week, we are going to have a preliminary report at the end of the week 
University of Michigan sentiment um, report. But what we're looking for there is, are consumers seeing inflation climb higher as they see gasoline prices rise? There is a direct positive correlation with rising gasoline prices and consumers' views about you know a year, five years down the road of higher inflation. The Fed will be watching that. It's very important. The Fed does not want consumers to see inflation rising. They want it to be anchored, meaning that it holds steady and not starting to rise. So overall, this is an extremely important week. And in terms of earnings this week, please pay attention to Disney. I always mention Disney. I'm not recommending it by any means, but for me, it is one of those bellwether names when it comes to consumer spending. Let's see what they have to say in terms of, you know, having a, um, you know, a, a hedge fund coming in and, and, and demanding changes. Let's see what they have to say about a pickup in demand uh, in, the, in the parks. Because as you know, the prices went up. We want to see, do those prices come back down? It's been harder and harder for uh, the average American to go in and pay for those tickets. If you have a family, uh, it's very, very expensive. So let's keep our eye on that because it, it really is one of the leading bellwethers in terms of consumer spending. And obviously, consumer spending is crucial in our country. It's 70 percent of GDP. But with the job market so strong, with unemployment rate down now to 3.4 percent, something we have not seen since decades and decades ago, right? I think it's 53 years ago. It's telling you the resilience is powerful. Uh, we'll also hear from um, Duke Energy. Obviously, this is important. We want to hear what they have to say about the energy landscape. And I'm also paying attention to a Danish company, Maersk, M-A-E-R-S-K. They are one of the leading companies in terms of logistics, in terms of you know, goods working their way around the world. We want to hear what they have to say about what they're seeing in terms of, you know, the basic underpinning for, for goods moving from one, one country and one port to another. And I'm also paying attention to Uber because they have gone through, you know, a lot of issues that every company has gone through in terms of um, their margins. And so, we want to hear, is their margin compression there? Do they have enough workers coming back to, uh, to be in those cars? It'll be an important, I think, uh, commentary, again, on business travel and, and the U.S. consumer using uh, Uber. But this week is important for the market. But pay attention also, please, to the U.S. dollar pay attention to the 10-year auction. We want to see where that settles because that's going to be extremely important as a marker of where international interest in the U.S. Treasury market, pension interest in the Treasury market comes in and puts a, a price on it. That's, that's basically we want to, what we want to see, a yield on it. So it's a quiet market in terms of of data releases, but an extremely important market when it comes to hearing from Fed Chair Powell tomorrow and a whole parade of Fed speakers during the week. But I'd pay more attention if I had to choose one, it'll be about Jerome Powell. Thank you kindly. Don't hesitate to get in touch. Have a very good week. Thank you all so very much. This material was prepared by LPL Financial. It's for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. There is no assurance that the views or strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal. Any economic forecast set forth in the podcast may not develop as predicted and are subject to change. References to markets, asset classes, and sectors are generally regarding the corresponding market index. All indexes are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. Index performance is not indicative of the performance of any investment and do not reflect fees, expenses, or sales charges. All performance reference is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All information referenced in the podcast is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy. Securities and 
Investment Advisory Services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and broker-dealer, member FINRA and SIPC. Insurance products are offered through LPL or its licensed affiliates. To the extent you are receiving investment advice from a separately registered independent investment advisor that is not an LPL affiliate, please note LPL makes no representation with respect to such entity. If your financial professional is located at a bank or credit union, please note that the bank or credit union is not registered as a broker-dealer or investment advisor. Registered representatives of LPL may also be employees of the bank or credit union. These products and services are being offered through LPL or its affiliates, which are separate entities from and not affiliates of the bank or credit union. Securities and insurance offered through LPL or its affiliates are not insured by the FDIC or NCUIA or any other government agency, not bank or credit union guaranteed, not bank or credit union deposits or obligations, and may lose value.